Good morning. We are going to start this morning with general questions, and our first question is from Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the impact on communities of banks reportedly closing branches without consultation, such as Santander in the South Scotland region. Minister Kate Forbes. I'm sorry to be answering this question again because I remain deeply concerned at the scale of branch closures across Scotland, concerns that will be shared by communities, vulnerable members of our societies and small businesses that rely on access to local banking services, particularly in rural areas like that represented by Claudia Beamish. I appreciate that banks must operate on a commercial basis. However, Santander and other banks must take into account the needs of all customers and digital should never be exclusive and the only means by which uh, customers can engage with their banks. Claudia Beamish. I thank the Minister for that answer and, and it is in, indeed very interesting the point she raised. I do agree with her on that but what st steps can the Scottish Government take to ensure that there is a pres presence on our high streets of banking and that's very important and also it's important to make sure that there are measures that the Scottish Government should be able to take to make it easier for credit unions to have a high street presence as well. Minister. I thank the member for that question. Of course, bearing in mind that banking is a reserved area, we still appreciate that the impact on communities is not uh, reserved. Just yesterday, I had a meeting with which who have done a lot of research in this area, and also with Unite the Union to look at the impact that branch closures are having um, on communities and on the employees as well. In terms of steps that the Scottish Government has taken, we uh, a, meet regularly with uh, banks themselves to make clear our disappointment with the scale of closures and the lack of consultation with communities in many cases, but also looking at alternatives. One of those alternatives are credit unions. And it's worth noting that there is a much higher um, level of the Scottish population enrolled in a credit union at 7.3% than elsewhere in uh, the UK. In November, we launched a campaign to encourage uh, people to sign up to credit unions and have also previously funded uh, junior saver schemes and the First Minister has written to employers to look at partnering with credit unions as well as uh, engaging with the post office too. Jackie Bailey. No consultation in advance, just a letter telling long-standing members of the Santander branch in Helensborough that they need to travel 40 miles for their nearest bank branch. Um, the minister said that she regularly meets with some of these banks. Has she met with Santander? Will she seek a meeting with them specifically to encourage them to reconsider the extent of their closures? Minister. Um, I would happily meet with Santander. I do make, meet with them regularly and make clear my disappointment in these areas. And as somebody who knows well the impact, in, particularly in rural communities, I recognise the huge impact. Scottish Government officials are currently in contact with Santander and will continue to engage with the bank. Again, we do all that we can with the powers that we have to make clear our displeasure. But at the end of the day, when it comes to regulation, that is a reserved matter. Question number two, Neil Findlay. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to alleviate the reported parking problems at St John's Hospital. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Scottish Government health officials met with NHS Lothian yesterday. The board takes this matter seriously and has taken steps to manage availability of spaces and to provide alternatives to on-site parking along with alternative forms of transport. The board remains committed to ongoing engagement with patients, staff, visitors and neighbours to understand and address parking related issues. Neil Finlay. Uh, hundreds of patients and staff and local residents have contacted me about the parking chaos in and around St John's Hospital. I've asked NHN, NHS Lothian officials to attend a public meeting so that they can hear ideas from patients, staff and residents about how these problems can be resolved. But so far they have refused to attend such a meeting. Surely NHS Lothian have to be accountable for their actions. And will the minister instruct them to come to a public meeting in Livingston to hear ideas from patients and those who use uh, the area in and around the hospital about how we can resolve these problems. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Of course, 66% uh, uh, of spaces are available to staff. Um, the board has reconfigured some of those uh, spaces that are available to increase the number of spaces available uh, to patients uh, in order to ensure that they are not late uh, for appointments and, to, uh, and they've received very positive feedback for that. The board advises me that they've received a very small number of complaints from neighbours, uh, around two to four complaints which have been dealt 
dealt with directly. The board does engage with staff through the uh, local partnership forum, which of course in our NHS is a very successful way of engaging with uh, staff across, uh, across an entire health board and in a particular site and reaching uh, shared uh, solutions to matters and they continue to engage with staff through that partnership forum as they look to plan uh, the new elective centre which will of course be based uh, at St John's. Uh, it is not for me to instruct the board uh, in this, this matter, it is for me to make clear to boards, to this board and to others, that I expect them to engage effectively and uh, continuously uh, with uh, the local community, neighbours, with staff, with patients uh, uh, and with others. They have uh, done some work to ensure a corporate discount scheme in terms of public transport and they've taken on a number of suggestions that have come to them from patients and staff through the, the work that they've undertaken. Mr uh, Finlay may feel uh, that that is inadequate but from my purposes as I said before it's not for me to instruct the board exactly how they do these matters. Uh, I could see criticism coming my way if I did precisely that probably from those very benches but it is for me to ensure that the board engages constructively and I will continue to ensure that they do that. Question number three, Lewis MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government when it plans to consult on setting a target for all homes to have at least a C energy performance certificate rating. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Scottish Government has already consulted on whether all homes should have to meet at least an energy performance certificate band C uh, rating. We consulted on this proposal last summer following the launch of our Energy Efficient Scotland route map uh, and welcome the ongoing cross-party support for this ambition. Uh, an analysis of the responses received was published on the 22nd of November and is available on the Scottish Government's website. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. The Minister will know that Paul Wheelhouse in November uh, made a further commitment and that in answer to a question uh, only on the 31st of January, uh, he said that, uh, they would, that the government would consult in March seeking views on whether energy efficient Scotland could be accelerated uh, and how the risks of doing that could be overcome. In that context, would the minister recognise that these certificates are currently calculated on the basis of cost efficiency, which fails to take into account the cost disadvantages of rural communities which are off the gas grid? And will he consider uh, taking the opportunity to base future ratings on kilowatts of energy used per square metre so that they are measuring carbon emissions rather than cost to consumers? Kevin Stewart. Um, thank you very much, President Officer. Um, as Mr Macdonald uh, pointed out, uh, Mr Wheelhouse, in answer to Tom Arthur on the 31st of January, uh, gave some detail uh, around about how we will progress uh, on these issues. Uh, Mr Wheelhouse said that we will set out in more detail uh, about the suite of legislation uh, the Scottish Government will bring forward uh, to deliver uh, on the Energy Efficiency Scotland pipeline. Um, and we will do so uh, in the very near future. Obviously, uh, we will look at concerns um, right across the board, urban and rural. Um, and as Mr Macdonald and others in the Chamber are, are probably well aware, uh, we spend more in energy efficiency uh, on rural areas per head of population than we do in urban, and we'll continue to do so. And Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. And on that note, can I ask the Minister what solutions the Government is considering to assist those in rural areas who have limited choice in heating fuel and often have harder to heat properties? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, uh, as uh, I said to Mr Macdonald, we are uh, committed to continuing to spend uh, more per head on energy efficiency in remote rural areas uh, where we know that installation and labour costs are higher. Um, since 2013-14, um, our remote and rural areas have received almost £64 million in investment through our home energy efficiency programmes. Uh, and this funding is distributed uh, based on assessment of need, which means remote areas receive more money per head of population to tackle fuel poverty. Uh, for example, the, the maximum uh, grant available to households in very remote rural areas uh, through the Heaps Area Base Scheme has risen since 2013 
to £9,000. Um, and that's compared with a maximum grant of £7,500 elsewhere in Scotland. Uh, we have reviewed uh, our Warmer Homes Scotland uh, programme, our, our National Fuel Poverty Scheme, to see how it can better support those in rural communities. Uh, and Ms Martin and others can be assured uh, that we will continue uh, to do all of that work. And Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and noting my register of interest in property, I would point out that there is an increasing frustration in the housing sector about the lack of guidance from the Scottish Government on the proposed EPC regulations due to come into force in 14 months. Now, details were supposed to be published early this year, but none have been forthcoming. So does the Minister understand the issues the lack of details at this late stage creates, and can he clarify exactly when this information will be available? Uh, President officer, we're going through a, a very rigorous process in making sure um, that we get all of this absolutely right. Uh, we want to ensure that uh, companies in Scotland, including companies like the one that Mr Burnett owns, uh, benefit um, from our energy uh, efficiency programme and that we do our very best uh, for the people of Scotland. We want to grow supply chains here and make sure that we have the labour and skills uh, to develop energy uh, efficiency properly. Uh, I realise that there are, are people out there who want us to move further and faster. What we will do, President Officer, is do this right. Question number four, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports of the proposed closure of the Cumberland Village Surgery. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Uh, thank you. We are aware of the situation at this branch practice, and NHS Lanarkshire have been in discussions with the pra practice about options for the future. The board will ensure, as it is required to do, that a primary care service continues to be made available to all patients and that patient safety is maintained at all times. My understanding is that the practice has recently closed a consultation uh, with two options available for consultation, but as yet no decisions have been taken. Mark Griffin. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Uh, if this pr proposed closure does go ahead, patients will go from a service on their doorstep to a five-mile bus trip, not a journey any of us would want to undertake when we're ill. Now, given previous interventions by health boards to directly run GP surgeries, in the event of a closure, will the Cabinet Secretary ask NHS Lanarkshire to step in and protect this vital service which my constituents in Cumberland Village depend on? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I, I completely appreciate uh, both the sentiment that Mr Griffith is expressing and the concerns of local residents who use uh, this particular practice uh, about uh, what may happen. We will ensure in our discussions with the Health Board and in the Health Board's discussion with, those, uh, uh, with the practice itself that uh, primary care continues to be available and continues to be accessible. Uh, at this point, it, is, it would be wrong of me to leap to conclusions until I see uh, what the GP partners want to uh, do as a consequence of their consultation uh, and the further discussions that they have with the Health Board. But I can assure their member that, that I and my officials will keep in close contact with this and do all that we can to ensure that that primary care service of the highest quality uh, remains available and remains accessible to patients in the area it serves. Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm the increase in funding to frontline health services and explain what this will mean for GP practices across Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, as Mr Lyle will know, we have in the budget a significant increase uh, to our frontline services. We are uh, moving very fast towards our overall aim of uh, over 50% of all health funding being directed towards frontline services. There is a significant investment in primary care and primary care reform and, of course, in the GP contract, which is an essential part of that, and significant additional investment from my portfolio area to local government for health and social care uh, partnership and the, those integration services. I'm very happy to give the member the specific uh, numbers for uh, his area of interest and indeed to provide that uh, to other members should they wish. But what is absolutely clear is that resourcing is significant in this area and we have the plans, we have the commitment and we now need to carry on and further the delivery of our ambitions. 
Question number five, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government what financial support it has provided for mental health services in the current parliamentary session. Minister Clare Hockey. In 2019-2020, the Scottish Government will increase direct investment in mental health by £27 million. And this will take overall funding for mental health to £1.1 billion. Mental health expenditure over the four years since 2016-17 will about, uh, amount to £4 billion. And as Mr Dornan is aware, mental health is a priority for this government, evidenced by specifically appointing a Minister for Mental Health and significant investment in the Scottish Government Mental Health Strategy, progress in which I updated Parliament last year, and there is a commitment to do so annually. James Dornan. Thank you. Uh, would the Minister agree with me that proposals in the draft budget to invest an additional £250 million over the next five years to improve mental health outcomes for children and young people is a step in the right direction? But would the Minister also agree with me that it is deeply disappointing that the Liberal Democrats, who have championed extra funding for mental health services over the last few years, will not support this inv important investment because of their constitutional obsession? Clare Hockey. I, I would agree with James Dornan. Yes, sir, £250 million investment will support the ambitions set out in the programme for government to build on the principles of early intervention and radically change what we do to ensure care and support is available as close to children, young people and their families as possible. The Better Mental Health Delivery Plan published in December, which includes a number of actions to reform children and young people's mental health and boards, will be expected to have in place by April improvement plans with clear milestones to be achieved over the next two years. But, presiding officer, while the Liberal Democrats talk about mental health and the need to invest in it and expand services, it's worth remembering that last week they voted against a budget which would deliver significant investment in mental health care. It appears the Liberal Democrats might talk the talk, but when they actually have the opportunity to support the Scottish Government in improving mental health services, they refuse to do so. Question number six, John Mason. Hey, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what consideration it has given to increasing pay for local councillors. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. A Scottish statutory, statutory instrument to increase the level of remuneration payable to local authority councillors by 2.8% with effect from the 1st of April this year was laid before the Parliament on the 1st of February. John Mason. I thank the Minister for that answer. MPs are paid some £77,000, we get £62,000 and councillors get £17,000. It does seem a little bit uneven, given that I uh, consider many councillors work just as hard, certainly as some MPs that I know. Uh, would the Minister not agree with that? Minister. Um, President officer, uh, Mr. Mr Mason has pointed out uh, the basic salary of councillors, as he is well aware, there is also um, special responsibility allowances uh, above that in many cases. Uh, the Independent uh, Scottish Local Authorities Remuneration Committee uh, considered in 2005 uh, whether councillors' pay should be comparable to that of MSPs, but concluded that it should not because the differences between the two roles are more significant than there are similar similarities. Uh, with MSPs, of course, being uh, legislators with a national role, uh, whereas councillors are responsible for uh, local services. Uh, the committee itself revisited the issue again uh, in 2010, and they came to uh, exactly the same conclusion. Um, as a former councillor myself, uh, I very much appreciate the contribution and the hard work of councillors uh, right across the country. Uh, but I'm not personally uh, persuaded that recalling the remuneration committee at this point uh, would lead to a different conclusion. Question number seven, Joan McAlpine. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met the Tenant Farming Commissioner. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. The Scottish Government officials last met with the Tenant Farming Commissioner on Thursday, the 24th of January, at his Tenant Farming Advisory Forum. June McAlpine. Thank you. As the Cabinet Secretary will be aware, the conduct of some land agent has caused concern for many. Can he advise me on what progress has been made in creating a code of conduct for individuals providing land agent services as the Land Reform Act provided for? Cabinet Secretary. Um, 
Uh, yes, the member raises an important issue. The Tenant Farming Commissioner's report on the operation of landlord and tenant farming agents was published in May 18, and I welcomed the report's findings. And this highlighted, uh, Presiding Officer, that the majority of landlords and their tenant farmers are content with their relationship, but for some individuals there are still issues. So the Tenant Farming Commissioner is currently working with the relevant professional bodies on producing a code of practice for land agents, which will include the standards expected of an agent and how to complain if an agent fails to meet those standards.